Hello, I'm Professor Pamela Scully. I am a professor in the Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies and the Institute of African Studies at Emory University. Today we're going to be discussing violence in a structural and a cultural context. We might think that violence is easy to understand, and sometimes this is true. Most people in the world probably recognize a stabbing or shooting as violence. But what about other forms of violence or other ways of thinking about violence? For example, let's consider structural violence. This term, structural violence, was defined by John Galton in 1969. He argued that structural violence is an, quote, avoidable impairment of fundamental human needs. And note the avoidable. The forms of structural violence would include racism, sexism, ageism, etc. Recently, other people have expanded on this term, including Paul Farmer, who's known for his work in medicine in the Global South, have expanded on the term to include political and economic inequalities. Farmer and fellow authors say, for example, that such arrangements, quote, put individuals and populations in harm's way. The arrangements are structural because they are embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world. They are violent because they cause injury to people. End of quote. It's from an article in 2006. Another way of thinking of structural violence is of the political, economic, and social conditions of a society that prevent people fulfilling their full potential in life. The reason to mention this is I would like you, every time you hear a statistic in this course and elsewhere, to think about what conditions might cause a particular individual to be less or more likely to be a victim of violence. What might lead a person to perpetrate violence? How do social, economic, political conditions frame our understanding of violence? Another way of thinking about violence is to think of it as located in culture. Can we think of violence in part as cultural? And if we did, what would that mean? So for example, ask yourself these questions. Is smacking a child for misbehavior violence? Can married women be raped in marriage? Let's take these two questions in turn. Spanking or smacking a child. Experts from a study of spanking in North Carolina, USA, argued that spanking, quote, has been associated with child abuse, victimization, poor self-esteem, impaired parent-child relationships, and child and adult mental health, substance abuse, and behavioral consequences. Being spanked as a child has also been shown to increase the likelihood of abusing one's own children or spouse as an adult." End of quote. That's a heavy list of, of items and results. Nonetheless, many people spank their children. In that study from North Carolina, which shows, as you can see in the table, that one third of the mothers interviewed had spanked their children. That study concluded that the older the mother, the less likely she was to spank her child. That, of course, was studying the relationship between mothers and children, not fathers. Different attitudes to spanking of children exist in different countries, which again returns us to this issue of to what extent is violence cultural, located in geographical realities, etc. For example, 38 countries have outlawed any sort of corporal or physical punishment which would include the spanking of children by their parents, teachers, and others. These countries include countries in Europe, such as Croatia, Norway, Sweden, Latvia, Germany, in South America, such as Brazil and Venezuela, and also countries in Africa, including the Republic of Congo and Kenya. That is not an exhaustive list. This is not to say that people in those countries that have outlawed punishment always follow the law, but researchers have shown that there's a correlation between laws and growing opposition to the spanking of children. So once you have a law saying that corporal punishment is bad, you're likely to see a follow-up in society where people begin to believe that is true, that it's not a good thing to spank a child. The second issue is rape in marriage. If we see rape as violence, as I think we've come to see, can we see forms of sexual relations in marriage as rape, and thus also violence? Some countries acknowledge the possibility of rape in marriage, and others do not. As far back as 1993, the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women 
included marital rape as a form of gender-based violence. Marital rape was legal in the USA until 1976, thanks to work by the feminist movement. That is, until then, 76, rape in marriage was not seen as a possibility. In many countries on every continent, people have outlawed marital rape, including South Africa, which did so in 1993. Some countries still do not recognize that rape can happen in marriage. This would include Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Liberia. Differences have to do in part with these ideas about consent. In some places, consent is seen as being given in the marriage ceremony, consent to sex. Thus, thereafter, it is understood that a woman may not refuse to have sex with her husband. That is clearly an understanding of consent that is located in a particular uh, place, time, and issues of consent therefore relate to how we think about rape, marital rape, the autonomy of women over their bodies. Thus, the issue of uh, how we understand violence is clearly a very complicated one. So clearly, there are differences across the world as to how we see violence. One final thing I would like to say is that research itself changes perspectives. For example, war used to be seen as something that soldiers fighting did to one another and no one really saw the rape of women as violence or as something worth studying. It was just seen as a byproduct of war. So we have the term rape and pillage. But now, research is being done on the history of rape and women in wartime. For example, there are new work coming out on rape in World War II by American soldiers and others. There's uh, work done on Vietnam, emerging work on the Holocaust. So now we see rape in war as a form of violence and are paying attention in part because there's so much of this going on in the contemporary era. We now know about how rape is being used as a weapon of war in Syria and the DRC. Thus, as we talk about violence, we need to think always about how our understandings of violence are shaped by the societies in which we live, the time period in which we live, by the time period we might be studying, and by the structural conditions in which people live also.